to um, activate their microphones and start talking and, and, and chat one to each other. All right, so the, all the attendees will be muted during the presentation. And if you would like to ask any question or make any comment, you can drop it into the meeting chat feature. And the speaker may pause during the webinar to answer some questions, uh, to attend some comments as well. Uh, some details about the webinar. Uh, this webinar will be available in our YouTube channel. After the session, uh, will be also posted as a podcast in the AACE Spotify channel, which will be released uh, very soon. We're working on 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 the channel and all the episodes we have for you. Uh, also, the slides will be shared on the follow-up email after the event. Uh, we'll be issuing a certificates of attendance uh, for AACE members only. Uh, which obviously you can use it for uh, CPDs with the Engineers Australia and also CEUs for uh, renewing your certification if you have one with the AACE International. And you can visit the, the website of the AACE Australian section for more details of future events. Uh, AACE you may already know it stands for Association for the Advancement of Cost Engineering. It serves the total cost management community since 1956. It is committed to the constructive exchange of ideas between members, uh, to the development of technical guidance and quality education, to multiple frameworks, recommended practices. Uh, we recently uh, celebrated the recommended practice number 100, which is a milestone for the AACE, and also is committed to the recognition of subject matter experts through the set of certifications that AACE offers to, to the members. And in Australia, so in Australia we have a, a very solid board. It's currently being led by Paul Harris, he's the president, and we have a a chair per state as well. We have Louis Vidotto representing Queensland. We have Alberto leading the New South Wales region. And in Victoria, we have Val Matthews. In Western Australia, uh, Alan Crow is leading. Uh, we are looking for people representing Northern Territory and South Australia. And um, yeah, if you uh, think you can contribute the four, five hours per, per week, I feel free to reach out to us. Uh, specifically, we have some volunteering opportunities in the membership secretary, that's one, the reporting coordinator, that's another uh, volunteer position, and training and development coordinator. So one more time, if you feel like you can contribute with 10 hours per month, roughly, please uh, let us know or we can arrange any uh, further details so that you can join us. Of the speaker, please um, let everybody welcome Alberto Sanchez. He's going to present how to use data analytics to improve decisions and project outcomes. He will explain the value of data on decision making process in complex and high risk projects. And he will present three case studies actually and the lessons learned that he um, obtained from those uh, case studies. Um, well, Alberto, I'm going to hand over to you if you are ready. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Frank. Sorry. Just share the screen. Give me a second. Can you see it? Yep. All good. Okay. Good. Okay. So welcome everybody. So um. It's very nice to see the list of people joining tonight. So I can see a few friends from the Middle East, um, friends from Russia. So yeah, I haven't seen some people for a long, long time. So it's nice to see you again, guys. So um, tonight we're going to talk about, you know, how to use data analytics to improve decision and project outcome. So uh, as Frank mentioned, I, I'm going to, to present, you know, a few case studies and how we use it, and and look at if you have any question, 
please feel free just to use the chat and then at the end of the webinar, we we can open the mics and and then you you are feel free to to ask any question. So um just to tell you a little bit about me, you know I have been working in planning and project control for twenty eight years now. I have been very lucky to be working with people, you know, in different places. You know, um, I was talking to Jacid, you know, a few minutes ago. You know, lucky to be, you know, the experience of working in places like in the UAE, in Oman, in Saudi, in Iraq. You know, friends that are in the list that, you know, work with them in Uzbekistan, they work in Russia, Asia. So I've been very lucky just to, to be working in all these places. Um, I'm a civil engineer in, um, and I came to Australia 21 years ago just to do my master. And now Australia is what I call home, even though I'm from the Spanish background. Um, I'm working as a group head of planning for a, for a multinational construction company that the head office is here in, in, in Australia. And, and I have been working with ASCE since last year as uh, the committee chair and I have been a member of you know, AAC since 1999. So um, AAC International, so um, obviously, you know, they cover, you know, different recommended practice, different fields of project and portfolio management, all the way from, you know, total cost management, planning, project control. But tonight we're going to be talking about an area that is, you know, becoming very, very popular that is benchmarking and historical data collection. And people, you know, have been using more, you know, data analytics and all different kind of, you know, data tools to, to improve the decision-making process. So the agenda for tonight, so a little bit of, you know, overview of the construction industry, you know, what is the data analytics in construction, the value of data through the project life cycle, some of the challenge that we face sometimes when you're trying to implement, you know, a, a data management in our organization, um, the different stages of the data analytics maturity in, in organization, the case studies, some lesson learned. <clears throat> and again, you know, feel free just to, you know, to use the chat if you have any question. So the construction industry overview, so the, the, there is a growing demand for um, construction projects to be fast track, you know, rushing the front end planning. So you can read a newspaper all the time and, you know, especially now during the COVID, you know, the government have been pushing to fast track, you know, very large infrastructure projects. The construction projects are becoming, you know, much bigger, more complex, you know, only here in Australia, we can see, you know, multi-billion dollar infrastructure projects like Sydney Metro, West Sydney Airport, Cross River Rail. So all these projects where we have multiple players and, and you basically need to make decisions in the early stage of the project with a lot of uncertainties. Unfortunately, in, in recent years, the construction sector have been plagued by delays and cost of a run and disputes. So you, you always see about, you know, a mega project to be delayed, you know, for years and cost of a run. And, and when you see and um, people start to analyze the issues they have in the project, they, they usually go back to, you know, the poor decision during the front end planning phase. So they say, well, look, we didn't make the right decision, you know, in the, in the early stage of the project, whether it was, you know, the right design or the right procurement strategy or the right the construction methodology. But the fact is that you, you are, you know, you're down in the track where you start to deliver the project and you realize that project the, the execution strategy wasn't really the best, or maybe your schedule or maybe your cost estimate was way too optimistic. <clears throat> So what happened now that is there is more scrutiny in recent years by stakeholders to justify the project. So they come in and say, well, we want to have an independent review uh, for the project. We have project assurance, you know, we have peer reviews. We want an independent engineering firm to do, uh, you know, a, a review of the project we, before we can move the project to the next phase. And that's when we start to look at the use of data analytics. Um, Look, and you see some of the projects here, you know, like the Sydney Opera House, you know, it was 1,400% over budget. <clears throat> People that are familiar with the oil and gas, the, the LNG in Gorgon, $20 billion over budget, you know, the big dig in Boston, you know, the big metro project, eight years behind, schedule, Denver, 
two years, you know, the, the three gorge dam in China, you know, four times over budget and and there are many more. So and and then you see, you know, why, you know, there is the, the sort of like the reputation that there is in the construction industry about, you know, projects being late, projects being, you know, over budget. So how how the construction industry can increase certainty and, and improve the project outcome? <clears throat> and that's when it, we, we go into data analytics. So the decision makers now, not only in, in, you know, in the public sector, but also in the private sector, are, are more focused on the use of data analytics as a powerful tool to support a very informed decision, you know, especially during the front end planning phase. And then, you know, to select, you know, what is the best path forward to, to deliver the, the, the project, you know, and should we, you know, you know, deliver the project in the in the form that it is now? Should we, you know, reconfigure the project? Should we think about deferring the CapEx? Should we think about just you know, a completely different solution? Or, or we just simply think that, well, this project is not economics. We, we should just, 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 you know, cancel the project. So, and, and that's why, you know, and, you know, more companies are using data analytics. We, we, we make decisions sometimes based on experience, you know, based on, you know, emotions and, you know, and, and sometimes we feel like, a, well, I had the feeling that this, the cost of this project is too high, you know, but look, you know, when, when you're in big projects and you need to justify the project to your shareholders, you know, emotions and experience is not enough. So you need to go back to, you know, show me the data, show me that what you're telling me is something that is within the range just to, to deliver the project. So um, then you, you have questions like, should we authorize or should we beat this project? And, and if so, have we completed a similar project within the required time frame or cost? So, you know, so we say, well, we, you know, we have a project that you know, we're beating and the client come and say, well, you, you have two years to deliver the project and our, you know, our budget is, is $400 million. So, so the first question is, you know, can we do that? You know, do we think that, you know, the, the, the two year is something that is realistic? And should we think that, the, you know, the, the $400 million is, is sort of like a budget that it, that it makes sense? And, and if, we, if we compare these to all the data that we have in the organization, we can decide whether, you know, we can go ahead and beat the project or if we are the owner or if we are the client, it's really just to think about, well, do, do we really think that, you know, you know, it makes sense? So we should go ahead and sanction the project. So, but what, what is data analytics? And so the, the data analytics is really just the process of re review, cleansing or cleaning and transforming and modeling the data to discover, you know, useful information. So we have pattern that it, it help you to, to make decisions. So, so what sort of information you, you use, you know, sometimes you have, you know, all these, you know, massive, you know, information in your organization that is all sitting in silos. You have progress records, you have productivity rates, you have weather data for multiple projects, you know, quality data, project schedules, cost data, you know, risk and opportunities, lesson learned. So, so what you're doing with the data analytics is really just to collect all this information, clean information and transform this into something that it create patterns and, and you can make decisions. So you start to, to see the link between, okay, how, you know, the weather have an impact in the project schedule, okay, or how many projects we have delays where we are working in this specific region, okay. So you, you start to look at some kind of pattern that it can help you to make, you know, better decisions. So how you use this? So it really the data analytics, you know, unify the database with historical data from multiple sources, okay, and I start to link the data to, to make sense. So the good thing about data analytics is it's just fast and ready, relevant information to decide whether it, you can go ahead with a project or not. So, um, so you know, I, I can show you some examples later about, you know, how to do very quickly, you know, some kind of, you know, conceptual cost estimate based on, you know, basic information about the project and see, well, you know, are within the range. If we are, you know, maybe we, we can just, you know, investigate more about the project and do some kind of due diligence before we can commit to, to spend, you know, more money. 
obviously the data analytics is just about you know discover uh, uncover you know patterns faster you know and, and promote better informed decision and the good thing about data analytics is you can you can provide multiple project scenarios based on vast amount of data so and again and I, and I will show you some examples and obviously you know what you really want with data analytics is to have more predictability in your schedules and the cost estimate that you have you know in the in the early stage of the project before you actually commit your resources to deliver the project so um, <clears throat> let, let's have a look at the value of data so if we look at the typical project life cycle you know so we have any project that you go from the early stage you know you, you have a business case you need to justify a project and <clears throat> you define the problem you know the project outcome and and you get to the first gate so the, the project justification so let's say you you are you are the government you have an issue with let's say with the congestion you know in in an area in in australia that you say well we need to resolve the problem so we have multiple options and you know the option could be to build you know a bypass could be building a tunnel building a highway you know you have multiple options so that's when you start to justify you know your project then you go to the next stage when you you select the option so you say okay so we came up with the time and cost and the risk and opportunity for the different options. So what are the time and cost, you know, for, you know, building a tunnel and what is the time and cost just to build a new highway or what is the time and cost just to, to build a new line in an existing road? So you, you go through different, different options, okay? Where you get to the point where you say, okay, I select the option. Now I need to define the scope and before we move into the delivery phase and that's when you actually sanction the project that's when you as a client say okay we have done all the due diligence so we're ready we sanction the project we get the funding where they get the money now just to actually just to go to the procurement phase where we start to subcontract the work or contract the work now if we look at this graph you know at the early stage of the project okay when we start with the front end planning on the first step the level of uncertainties are very, very high, okay? Because you don't know what you're going to do at this point. You don't know when you're going to start construction. You don't know if it's going to be a tunnel, whether it's going to be, you know, uh, a new highway. So the level of uncertainty is very, very high. But at the same time, the level of influence and the, and then the ability to improve the outcome of the project is very high because that's when you have all the decision making process okay so you can see in the graph through the project life cycle that the level of influence is start to drop when you start to get close to the delivery of the project or what we people call you know the detailed design and construction and commission of the project the uncertainties at the same time obviously start to get you know a, a better definition of the project scope you know because you, you start to get to the point where you really understand what is going to be your solution what is going to be your option and you have a better understanding of your procurement strategy but the point is that when, when you get into the gate three that is when you're going to sanction the project to get into the procurement and you probably just at the point where you are ready to spend more money okay so you can see the expenditure so and it started to get bigger it started to get larger because that's when you start to move into the construction phase of the project okay and that's what we say that poor or late decision can can cost a lot of money at the later phases in the project life cycle so that's why i if we if we go right in the top on the uncertainties that's why we say that the the historical data that you have in your organization is really really valuable to make decisions because it's based on historical data it's based on a lot of information that you have for similar projects that can help you to make a better decision okay so and and that's what people call the, the front end planning okay and it's basically just the, the justify the select and the define phase where we get to the point that we develop the scope with a higher degree of predictability in terms of schedule, cost, and quality, 
to make the decision. What is important also in this process is that when we move to the delivery phase and we start to complete the design, we start to procure and we start to build the asset, whether it's just an infrastructure, it's an oil and gas, or it's a hospital, stadium, is that we start to feed again our data management system with actual information of the project, okay? So it's really just to, to feed back the information to keep the data with relevant information. And it gives you really good, you know, insight to see what is the, 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 you know, the comparison between what we plan against, you know, what we actually deliver, okay? So I, I don't know if we have any question uh, at this point, Frank, or, or we just, just continue. Mm, not really, but I think we should continue. Yep. Okay. So um, this is some interesting information that, that I, I found, you know, in, in a technical article from the University of Texas, that is said that increasing data usability by 10% can lead to productivity improvement between 20 to 50%. So 50% is retail, they probably use a lot of information about how customers behave, and you know, the, the different patterns, you know, and, and, and you can see, you know, when we're using, you know, our mobiles, you know, and you search on something in, in Google, you, you start to be bombarded by, you know, advertising and something that said to see, you know, what is your, your, your behavior. But it's interesting to see also in construction that you know using data have been you know increasing in, in you know in productivity. So so we start to look at you know you know you know in artificial intelligence, you know machine learning, and, and many things where we start to look at you know improving the in the production rate on site when we start to use data and we start to make better decisions. Now, you know, not everything is, is, is just perfect, you know, and there, there is a lot of challenge, you know, with the, with the implementation of data management in organizations. So something that I found and probably one of the biggest challenge is just the fragmented data ownership. Okay, so where you, you, are, you have an organization where, you know, the, the, all the cost information is owned by the cost department the schedules are owned by the planning department, you know, the procurement information is owned by the procurement department. So the information is owned at the department level rather than across the business as a whole. Okay, so, it, and it's really just about how to break the, si the, the silos to actually connect information across the different department. Then the other issue that, that, that I found is the lack of clear process to collect and process the data. Okay, so who is responsible for collecting the data? So if you are working in construction, who is the person responsible for collecting, you know, production rate? Okay, how often are you going to do this? Okay, and, and then, you know, how are you going to, to process the information and how you can ensure that the information that you collect on site makes sense? Okay. Um, I remember just, you know, implementing some kind of data tools in, in, a, in an organization that worked many years ago in the Middle East. You know, we, we end up with issues with, you know, you collect production rates and you're not with something like, uh, we have production rate for pipeline that it got, you know, you know, 12 diameter inches per day, you know, for welding. And then you have another project, you have, you know, 28 and you feel like, well, hold on guys, you know, something here, it doesn't make sense. And, and it was really just to understand what was behind the production rate, you know, the, the context. So, and then we found like, a, oh, well, well, hold on, you know, the, the production rate for this one is based on a, in a plant that is in operation, it's a brownfield and it's a small bore compared to the other one that is a pipeline and it's really just, you know, a, a big pipe and it's using semi-automatic welding machine. So it's really just to, to, to understand the process, not only to collect, but also to process the data. Then the another issue that you have is multiple data sources with conflicted data. You know, when, when you end up with, you know, the, the cost department and the planning department, they collect production rate and they know we conflicting data. So they found that, you know, the data is not exactly, you know, what, what we collect. Then, you know, it's a poor data culture. So they lacking the culture to manage data properly. So where you have organization where, you know, all the information that I collect on site, you know, for my project is sitting in my 
hard drive. Okay, so uh, so there is not a that culture in the organization where well, all the data has to be collected in a specific way. You, and then you need to put this in a specific place where you know people can clean it and, and use it for future projects. The other issue is just the sometime that it's difficult to combine data from multiple data systems. And, and this is something that you know there is a lot of you know software package that they are actually just coming with solutions about, okay, look, I can collect data from Primavera, I can collect data from SAP, I can collect data, you know, from different, you know, document data management system and, and have a data breaker where I can collect everything and, and connect the data into a, a single platform. And, and that's an area where, you know, many years ago it was a lot of issues because, you know, sometimes you have systems that don't talk to each other. The no issue is sometimes the manual compilation of data. Okay, leading to mistakes. So, so you have people that, you know, they actually just collect information, they walk to the site, and they're doing everything manually. So, and and then you go back to the site office, and they start to to write down all the information in an spreadsheet in Excel. So, so all these manually compilation of data lead usually to you know to mistakes on time. And you have organization now that they are very clever and they start to use drones. They start to use sensors where you can see when the truck comes to the site, when the truck leaves the site, and, and you start to collect production rates and all these sort of things, you know, in, in, in you know, all the all the technology that is, is available now, you know, in, in the market. And you know, and another issue is just that sometimes it's difficult to trace the source of the project data, especially if you have a project that it was complete many years ago. So I you know, you're working in an organization, you go to a project and I say, oh, look, I collect this, the production rate for this project or the cost rate or lesson learned. And, and it, this is fantastic, you know, but I need to verify something. And then, you know, the project was completed in 2005 and, and none of the project team members are working in the organization anymore. So it's sometimes it's difficult to trace, you know, the source of the data. So that's sort of the challenge that you face sometime when you start to to implement you know data management in your in your organization. So if you look at this as a journey, okay, I would say that you go probably through five different stages. So in the first stage in the journey or in the maturity of the of the data analytics in the organization is is really just collecting data. Okay, so this this is really just the first step. You know, you gathering data in silos, and so in just in different different you know departments or or, or or different places. So whether it's progress records, whether it's productivity, whether it's weather data. But the good thing is at least you are collecting data. Okay, the second stage is really just processing the data. So it's really just cleansing the raw data. So what what is the meaning of cleansing? It's really just that you clean the data you have and, and you start to look at, you know, what it makes sense, you know, what information you have that is outside the range that you have. So that's really the first step to break down data silos. The next step is really just to, to identify patterns and variants and relationship. OK, so to give an example. You know, I take, you know, projects that I complete, you know, you know, let's say, you know, when I was working in Southeast Asia, you know, I was looking at the projects in the last five years and I say, OK, you know, we have 20 projects that we work in the last five years. How many of these projects were delays because of weather? Okay, and you start to look at a pattern where you say, look, that we have a pattern here where projects got delayed, you know, because of the monsoon or because of the rainy season in the south of Thailand when we were doing, you know, the earthwork piling foundation. Then the next one is just predicting, okay? So it's really just a manual prediction of the project outcome. So, you know, for example, with the assigned resources, what is the likelihood that we can meet the completion dates? So you, you start to make some kind of manual prediction based on the information that you have. And then you get into the last stage that is really just advising. So it's using these automated data analytics to identify opportunities and improve decision and project outcome. And I will give you some examples with the case studies where we use in, in a company that worked before where you, you have a sample of, you know, 
400 projects and and you just need to go and, and put some you know some project specific data project location and you know you know the plant capacity and then you can come up with a range of you know you know the project you know time and cost let me see i have a question here so um, hi alberto multiple data sources used by different departments is quite common project or major project what's the best way to overcome this issue based on your experience Look, my experience in, in company I worked before in companies like Wally Parson and Samsung, we end up with the creation of uh, a global benchmark initiative where, where we have you know, a team that it was responsible for managing the data in the organization. You still had different departments collecting the information, but we were feeding the data management and the data governance groups. And and we we create some kind of rules about you know global code of account you know standard work breakdown structure and standard milestones and and we produce the standard uh, progress sheet where where people on site they all will have to collect information in the same way and and then we also have the rules where you know every quarter you know the head of the regional planning and project control need to collect all production rate and send them to the central office. So that does, you know, but it, it took, you know, it was a two years journey just to agree on this. Then we have a question from Matt. Do you think that data usage and maturity is getting better in construction after the ISO digitalization information was released? I, I think, I think so, Matt, you know, and I know that we have been, you know, you know, trying to implement many of these and and, and I think, you know, the, the, the use of more standardization and the digitalization of information have been really good. Obviously, you know, digitalization is, is just the tool. What is important is just you, you have a process in place. Um, I have seen a lot of organizations where they think that, you know, if you go and procure the software, you know, it's going to solve the problem. You really need to understand the process that you want to implement before you go and find a, a technical solution. Um, yeah, as projects get more complex, do you think this reduced reliance on benchmark? <clears throat> well, look, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think it, it all depends on, you know, you know how you catalog your benchmark. Um, I have been using benchmark in very complex projects, you know, in, you know, rebuilding Iraq. I was working there and, you know, we, we use benchmark for, for different sections. It really depends on how you break down your project to look at the benchmark for different components. Okay, so uh, look, uh, I just did a survey, you know, a few months ago, you know, which was interesting to see. And I say, in your opinion, where is your company on data analytics maturity? I think I got something like 800 people reply to the to the survey, um, and it's interesting to see that it's you know, different stages, you know. Obviously, you know, you, you need to unpack this, you know, information you have to understand, you know, you know, you know, what sort of company you're working for, you know, you know, you're working, uh, you know, as a client and you're working as a contractor, you know, you're working construction, what type of construction, but, but it was really just, just to, to have a, a little bit of understanding about the, the maturity of the data analytics. And, and, and you can see that, you know, um, there is a, still a lot of companies in the, in the process of collecting data and, and trying to identify patterns. Uh, I, I was very surprised and maybe pleased to see that, you know, there are, you know, companies that are using automatic data analytics, which obviously, you know, it save, save a lot of time and help you just with, with, in, with your process to, to make better decisions. Now let, let's, let's go up to, you know, three case studies. And that I, I was involved, you know, some years ago, and then I, I will show you an example with, with a with a tool. <clears throat> so, so let's see how that analytics help these companies in making, you know, better decision and improve the project outcome. So the first one is is a food processing plan. Uh, this is a a new food plan. You know, the target cost for the client was around 20, 25 million dollars and then 18 months. So the, the, the company was seeking approval 
to invest in the construction of a new facility as part of the market expansion. So the, this project was in, in Europe. Um, the project was on what we call the define phase. So we're uh, still in the front end planning. And, and as part of the decision gate, the assurance team, you know, have to, to do some kind of, you know, comparison with similar projects. So um, I, I was involved in the, in the peer review team. So how we use this, and um, we compare this facility with, uh, with facilities that were built in, in the past, in the, in the last 10 years. And, and we look at the range that we have for dollar per square meter for this you know, type of plans. Uh, and we came up with a, with a high level cost estimate of that, you know, that the project should be more in, in the range of $27 million. So we are talking about $2 million more than the, you know, the, the original estimate in the business case. So what happened at this point, and the, the company just decided to, to put the project on hold and doing a form and working group and, and perform value engineering to see if we can find some potential cost saving uh, or maybe just to build the plan in, in stages so instead of just going with the full production, just to ramp up production, you know, and just to improve the cash flow before they actually move into the delivery phase. Um, after we spent a few weeks doing different scenarios, the company decided that, you know, the project wasn't economic uh, and they decide to upgrade an existing facility to increase production instead of building the new, the new plan. So the, the process that we did, you know, in the, the, the tool that we use, you know, we, we had the option to, to, to actually use the, the project specific input where we say the, the location in Europe. So it was very specific on in Europe where we want to you know, build the facility. You need to say what well, is a greenfield, it's a brownfield, it's a revamp. We also, you know, put in the system, you know, what is the, you know, the tons per year of production for this facility the timeline, and, and you also say what is the, the design status. Why we had to explain the design status is because there is something here very important that is to understand the design growth allowance. So if you have a design that is not complete, the tool that we use automatically can calculate the potential growth in quantity from the design development. Okay, so they say, look, at this point, the basic design, you had the configuration of the plan, you had the equipment layout, you probably had the large pipe, but you still are missing instrument and control and few minor components. You probably have the major steel structure, but you are missing the minor steel structure because you haven't designed this yet. And an automatically tool that we develop can tell you that, you know, it's going to be a design grow allowance of steel in 10% and design grow allowance of concrete in 8% and it can give you some kind of increase on the quantities based on the stage of the design. So the data analytic also gives you the range conceptual estimates so it automatically give you what is the minimum, the most likely and the maximum time and cost for similar facilities and, and it can give you a benchmarking and historical data for you know what is the dollar per square meter for these sort of facilities. Something good also about the tool that, that we developed was the location factor. So if I decide that I want to build the facility not, not in Poland, I want to do it in, you know, in, in Spain, or I want to do it in Belgium, or I want to do it in France, the tool had the capability to, to adjust the, the labor and the material cost based on location factor. Again, we're talking about this is the front end planning. So it was really just with, you know, with a plus minus of 20% accuracy. But the idea was really just to see if we are within the range. So how did that analytics and the tool help the project outcome? Well, first, you just validate the accuracy of the project schedule and the cost estimate. Then, you know, validate the project assumption that we use in the business case. So we, we use assumptions about, you know, the utility consumptions. We, we use assumption about, you know, the, the quantity, you know, for the civil, for the steel. And we identify risk and opportunities, you know, of the, the new project based on historical data. And, and obviously provide historical information to evaluate project alternatives. So we, we also look at 
okay, hold on. If we decide that we don't want to build a new facility and we want to increase one production line in one of the existing facilities, how much is going to cost? So it was very easy for us just to go into the tool and say, well, how much it will cost to increase the production line and increase the utilities for an existing facility? And, and obviously provide you know, decision makers with a valuable information to decide whether or not to authorize the funding of the, of the new project. To do all this process, and, and we were lucky that we have all the tools and all the data, it took us probably just about something between four to six weeks. So, um, and it, because it also involved, you know, all the decision process and all the workshops. Then we, we have, uh, you know, a, another example, you know, um, it was when I was working in, in the Middle East. And this is an, an, an oil plant, a refinery. So um, it was a, an oil company that signed a pre-agreement with an oil company to expand a, a process uh, capacity to an existing refinery. So they say, look, we need to de-bottleneck a refinery. We want to increase production. And, and this, you know, this company de decide that they're going to partner with the national oil company to do it. And when they started to do the design, uh, it became, you know, apparent that the, the schedule was unachievable. So, and, and then we also started to look at the cost estimate. We, we refined the cost estimate or they refined the cost estimate and, and realized that it was about 20% higher than the target estimate. So the project was, you know, not feasible. So at that point, the company engaged an, an independent engineering firm that I was, I was working at the time to, to revisit the viability of the, of the project or the select project option. So we, we use, again, an in-house modeling tool. Um, we have around 400 similar facilities where we can very easily just to run different models and, and come up with, you know, what is the cost of a new process train, the utilities, the infrastructure, the pipeline. And, and what happened, you know, at the end is just we, we realized that, you know, the, the, the cost estimate was really just, you know, underestimated. And so uh, after a few months, you know, the, the company decided just to cancel the project. So they spent a few million dollars in the, the design, the studies and service, and they say, well, the project is not economic. We rather, you know, you know, lose ten million dollars than, you know, embark into a journey to deliver a three point five billion dollar project and then realize that the project is going to cost, you know, four billion or more. So how we use this, and again, we we use our data tool, and where we say the location of the project, you know, you, again, you can say what well, the project was in in Saudi Arabia, or was in the UAE, was in Oman, you know, and the project type, so you know, you know whether it's a revamp, with a greenfield. Why? Because automatically the tool can adjust the production rate if the plan is in operation when you're doing a revamp. And again, you put the plant capacity based on barrels per day. You know, we put the timeline and and we say, well, the project, uh, the design at the at the time that we're doing the analysis, it was a basic design. The data analytics, how we use it again, you know, we, we came up with a uh, with range of conceptual estimate, you know, what is the minimum, the most, the most likely, the maximum. We use benchmarking and historical data where the average cost, you know, per barrel per day, location factors, um, and again for labor and, and materials, and we come up with a different contingency. Um, so how this really helped, you know, the, the decline, you know, at this point. Well, again, we just validate the accuracy of the project schedule and the estimate. Uh, we validate the project assumptions using the business case. So we actually realized that that you know the that it was um, an assumption about the increase in the capacity of the facility that you may not need. And we identified the risk and opportunities. Uh, we provide historic information to evaluate what we call the cost blocks. So the cost block was really just the tool was developed in a way where you split the refinery into different sections where you have, you know, your process area, you have your utilities areas. And, you know, from the utilities areas, you can see what is the typical cost for power, water, and nitrogen, and, and then you can do the ratio between the process and utilities. 
and it can really help you, you know, very high level to see the ratio between, you know, what you you estimate for the process area against the utilities, and and obviously provide, you know, you know, really good information for the decision maker to decide that look, look, we we have done all the due diligence, you know, this project is is not feasible. Then the next one is really just a, you know, a, a gas infrastructure. So it's a project in Asia. Um, the project was around $3.5 billion. It, it was an energy company that signed an agreement with the local government to build a gas infrastructure project. Uh, it was really just to meet the growing energy demands. The, the only is that when this company signed the agreement, it was a clause for a fund cap contribution for the government. So what it means is, you know, if they agree that the project is going to be 3.5 billion and it's going to be a 50-50, if the project end up in 4.5 billion, the government wouldn't actually compensate the private company with additional cost. Okay, so it was cap. So the private company was exposed to any time and cost overruns. So again, as part of the decision gate, um, an independent team was appointed to do a peer review. I, I was part of the peer review team for this project. And, and again, we use our global database, you know, with our tool to develop some concept screening estimates and, and provide really just good information to the client. So um, when we use this, um, we actually found that um, the, the plan was over-designed. Okay, so we found that Look, there is something here that doesn't make sense. You know, we, we look at the, the cost of the pie rack, we look at the cost of the utilities, and we say, look, there is something here that doesn't make sense. And, and when we started to look at the design basis, we found that, you know, there were some sections of the plan that were over-designed, and they were doing some, they had some expectation that they're going to increase the, the, the production. We talked to the people from the reservoir, and they said, look, there is not going to be an increase of, you know, this, this production, this is the flat, this is the plateau that we have in production. And, and then, you know, we came up with, you know, with some solution just to reduce, you know, the size of the pipe rack, size of the pumps, size of the pipes. And obviously, if you reduce the pumps and the rotating equipment, you can also reduce, the, you know, the utilities. So we end up with, you know, bringing it down, you know, the cost of the project in, you know, probably something like a 500, 600 million dollar. And obviously, you know, if you reduce quantities, you can also reduce the time to deliver the project. So and this project was delivered. So it was a very successful project. Um, and, and if we go in detail, you know, here, so you can see that, again, we use the, the data tools and we put the plan location where the project was located. It was an upstream facility. And we used the, you know, the plant capacity, which was basically, you know, billion of cubic meters of, you know, of gas production. Um, and we came up with a range of conceptual estimates, you know, the minimum, the most likely, the maximum. We, we use all the benchmarking. So we say, well, what is the dollar per billion cubic meter to build the gas processing plant? And, you know, the dollar per kilometer of pipeline. And we came up with very good conceptual cost estimate to do the comparison. And we also had the location factor where we can see, well, if we're building this project in another place, what should be the increase or decrease, you know, for labor and material, which is possibly the, the main component, you know, for the location factor, and then, you know, the, the contingency allowance. So how did that analytic help? You really just validate the accuracy of the project schedule and the cost estimate. We we actually reviewed the, the assumption and then we realized that, you know, the, the the capacity it was of the plan was over designed. And we identify opportunities, obviously, because we look at the option just to reduce the size of the pipe, the size of the pumps, the size of the pipe rack. It provides historical information to assess the cost blocks, so the pipeline, the utilities, and, and provide decision makers, you know, really good information to decide whether or not to go ahead. So obviously with this project, they decide to go ahead. They delivered the project and the project was delivery on time and on budget. I have another another case story. Unfortunately, I couldn't actually present this because there is a lot of confidentiality. But uh, but it was for a line sign for a pharmaceutical where we we have a client where they were based in Europe and they want to expand the the market to the Middle East. 
Um, and we had to do, we had six weeks to do uh, a, a very high level feasibility study. And, and it was really just for the client to decide where to build the facility. So they, they were thinking about building the facility in, in Dubai, in Saudi Arabia or Qatar. So obviously using this tool help us to make a decision fairly quick where we look at you know, location factors. So we actually estimate the project you know, based on building this in Dubai as a basis. And then we, we put this in our tool where we can see the labor and material location factor, how the labor and material change you know, if you do this in Qatar or if you're doing this in Saudi Arabia. So it was fairly quick just to come up with different scenarios. So uh, let, let me show you an example. You know, this is, you know, uh, sort of like a, the, the, the tool that, that we use. You know, um, obviously, the tool is in a very sophisticated software, but look, the, just to give an example, the, this is, you know, sort of like the tool that we use for um, um, offshore facilities. So you, you can select here and say, look, and uh, at this point, I'm doing, you know, a, a review for a project that is in defined phase, what we call the, you know, the, the, the pre-planning phase. You know, say, look, and we're doing a, a, a top side, we're doing a platform. Um, we want to see, you know, what should be the cost of the top side versus the weight of the top side. Um, and we're doing this project, let's say that the, the project is going to be built, you know, in the, in the shore of, you know, Africa. Let's say that we're doing this, I don't know, in Libya. Or, um, and we say, look, uh, you know, my project, you know, the, you know, the, the weight of this top side, let's say it was 50,000 tons. Um, and we estimate the project to be, you know, in the range of, I don't know, $500 million. Okay. So then, you know, you can give you a very quick, you know, you know, a range of, you know, how your project compared to all the projects in, in the region. So what you see here, the number of observation, what it means is we have 19 projects that we complete. This is based on projects in the last five years and that we complete in the last five years. We had 19 projects or 20 projects in Africa and, and it can give you sort of like a pattern about where the project should be. So if we say that, look, my estimate was, I don't know, 430, you know, you can see that you are in the low side and, and your data analytics actually tell you that your project should be more in the range of $502 million. Okay, so again, you know, something fairly quick just to give you very good idea about you know where should be the range of your your costs and, and we had the same for time and we have similar tool for you know pipelines you know onshore facilities stadiums you know hospitals you know and we had this you know for i can't remember i think that we have something like a forty-seven thousand projects in in the database so let me just go back to the presentation. Okay, just give me a second. So obviously, um, you know, data analytics, you know, provide valuable information for decision makers and to decide whether or not to authorize the funding of the, of the project. Or if you are bidding a project, you are the contractor, it's really just to, to decide whether the project is within the range to, to go ahead and you say, look, you know, the client expectation from the time or cost point of view, you know, they are not feasible. There is no point for us just to go ahead and bid the job. So um, some lesson learned. Um, look, when you're trying to implement, you know, data analytics, data management in your organization, well, first of all, you know, prepare a data management strategy to meet the business need. And so don't, don't just go and jump into software solution straight away. You'll think about what is the strategy? What do you need? Do you want to implement data analytics because you want to improve, you know, you know, to be more competitive or, or because, you know, you, you have way too many projects that have been delayed or cost of a round or because you want to get into a market you are not familiar with. Then, you know, you need to be sure that you, you invest the right time in analyzing the existing project data. This is the project itself. And, you know, 
you collect all the data and and it takes time just to to push the data, you know, to clean the data and to understand, you know, what is behind the data you have. Then you need to ensure that there is a clear process to collect and process the data. So, you know, you don't finish with, okay, I collect all this data for the last 10 years and that's it. And it is really just about, you know, to ensure that you, you keep, you know, the process and how you're going to maintain the data, who's going to be the person to be the custodian of the data and to ensure that it's always relevant. Then, you know, promote a data-driven culture, that value, making decisions using data. So you can see that more and more organizations are now based on show me the data, you know, you know, show me that, that, you, that we have done this before. And then you need to promote the data governance. You know, you need to be sure that, that the data that you have in the organization is current, is accurate, is complete, is relevant, so on. So there are organizations that they have their own data governance group that they ensure that this has happened. And obviously, you know, avoid the fragmented data ownership and data systems. So trying to ensure that, you know, you use unified systems to collect data across, you know, different departments. And, and then just to, to finalize and some recommended practice, you know, from the ACE, you know, profitability methods, you know, conduct, conducting technical and economic evaluations, and this is really good. It makes a lot of reference to historical data, data analytics, you know, the use of decision trees and decision making. Again, you know, really good information about the process and data analytics. And, and finally, the cost control software requirements that can help you to decide where, you know, when you select, you know, what is your data analytics software that you want to implement in your company. These recommended practice have really good information about what you need to look from the technical and process point of view. Okay, so we finish here. So I think um, I have another question here. Let me see how to convene decision making or implementing latest innovation tools like artificial intelligence, machine learning, which seems like a chicken and egg scenario. But look at you, 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 unfortunately, you know, we are in, a, in an industry that many of these innovations are coming as a requirement from clients. Okay, so I'm, I have been in projects where it's really the client who is driving all these initiatives where I want to use drones, I want to use sensors to see, you know, how many trucks coming in and out of the site and using, you know, you know the, the slow motion videos so we can analyze lesson learned. And, and many of these are, are coming from clients. Um, you know, and, and the, the good thing is, is slowly companies start to realize that this is something that can help you just to understand, you know, what, what is the best methodology. So in, in the company working now, we can go back and, and look at the videos about how we did some specific work and, and see, well, is this the best practice? Is that something that we should keep doing or something that we need to improve? Um, Artificial intelligence, look, I have been in conversation with a lot of people about artificial intelligence, you know, AI for planning. You know, keep in mind that artificial intelligence is no more than something that is connecting to a database and the data is coming from your own organization providing the data. So if the quality of the data is not really good, the AI is not going to be, you know, of any use. Um, so I think before you you go into this journey about implementing, you know, AI, machine learning, you need to be sure that you have the right process in place to to collect and clean the data. Um, well, Frank, I think that we can open the mic and people can. Throw yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, before before stopping the recording, uh, well, I'm just going to. If the last word just to close the event. Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I uh, thank you Alberto for accepting presenting tonight. Um, it's been um, hectic out there to find that presenter and you as usual um, very willing to to expose your your experience and and your knowledge. Um, again, everybody, uh, feel free to unmic or open your microphone to. Start chatting uh, after 
uh, actually right now because I'm stopping the recording right now. <laughs>